Hello and welcome to NARC Live on Wednesday the 23rd of March 2022, coming to you live from Norfolk on the east coast of England with Tammy M0TC. Hello. And me, David G7RP. Great to see you on tonight's show. It's an In The Shack interactive and tonight's all about propagation and propagation tools. You'll be able to ask questions and offer solutions and everything else as well. Who said traditional analog television was dead? And we find out what on earth this is. And we've had loads of entries, loads. It's one of those things where I had to do an extra piece of paper, but lots of them are different and they're the lovely ones. So anyway, if you haven't entered and you want to, you've just got time to pop it onto BATC or Facebook. But first, some really good news. I hope most of you, all of you will find this good news because as I said, we had our NARC committee meeting last Thursday evening to discuss how we take forward your mandate. Those of you members of Norfolk Am Trading Club who voted, over 100 people voted on what they wanted the club to do in terms of meeting for real in person. And we had a meeting last Thursday evening and I can now give you the dates when we're after our first meetings, which is very exciting after two years of this. So the first meeting will be on Wednesday, the 6th of April. And we've got a slide here just to put that up there. If you want to make a note of that in your diary, although of course we've got a couple of weeks between now and then, and we'll remind you of it again next week. But it's Wednesday, the 6th of April is our first meeting. And then our next in, you know, face-to-face -face meeting will be on Wednesday, the 11th of May, an annual general meeting. Now I've, I've called this here a social informal or a, um, you know, a welcome back really, the Wednesday the 6th of April. We've not got anything specific that night because many of us haven't seen each other for two years. Um, so I think that you know it's more important that we get together and chat. Um, we know, in case you've joined us and you just think, oh, what are they doing? You know, this is something that you know, two -thir over two thirds of you asked us to do is that you were ready to start meeting again. But we realise, of course, that COVID isn't over. But we also accept, I think, most of us that we have to live with it. So we'll be making this as safe as possible. Um, the room that will be at, at CNS will be exactly the same as we used to meet, which is the sixth form common room towards the front of the school. But that is only used now for lunch times as an overspill for the canteen. And it's thoroughly cleaned afterwards and not used at all until we meet in the evening. That's one difference. Uh, the windows, we will be opening the windows, so we've got plenty of fresh air because that's one of the best ways that you can really prevent COVID spreading around. And doing things, all sorts of things like, for example, tomorrow I've got a little delivery coming of packets of biscuits all sealed in plastic. Little things like that that we're going to do to make it safer. Anyway, you'll have plenty of opportunity to write those dates down from other things that we'll be putting in the newsletter and we'll tell you a bit more about them nearer the time but we're really looking forward to getting back. Of course, that does mean as well on that, the 6th of April, there won't be an ARC Live, which is uh, gonna be strange for us. I'll tell you, actually, can you put a memo in the phone to remind us, we're gonna have to wear trousers that night. Oh, okay, yeah, fine. It's <laughs> <laughs> not true. Um, okay, anyway, so that's, that's, that's our first meeting in exciting times, I think you'll agree, after literally two years of this. Uh, but hopefully you've enjoyed Dark Life as well. We're keeping it everybody together. And we'll be taking some pictures and some videos probably and show them to us. I know not all of you will be able to make that meeting. So of course we'll, we'll try and show you what it was all what it was all like. Um, now we've had some topical news really from John M6JAU who found this story about the propagation of signals on Hackaday. Um, we've got a slide here and I'll read what goes with it from Hackaday. While internet-based streaming services appear to be the future of television, there are still plenty of places where it comes into the home via a cable, satellite or antenna connection. For most satellite transmissions, this now means a digital multiplex carrying a host of ch channels from a geostationary satellite for which a sa set-top box or another decoder is required. But imagine the surprise of satellite watchers and when the Russian polar communications satellite Meridian 9, which has a highly elliptical orbit, was seen transmitting old-style terrestrial analogue television. What on earth was happening? Well, the TV signal in question comes from Turkmenistan. So, met some, so were some homesick Turkmenistans in an Antarctic base being treated to a taste of their country? Well, the truth's far more interesting than that, because we've all heard of the idea that somehow every TV show ever transmitted is somewhere out there, still travelling as radio waves across space, 
Uh, while perhaps we can't fly out far enough to check for 1960s Doctor Who episodes, it's true that the horizontal transmissions from a TV tower pass out into space as the Earth curves away from them. Thus, Meridian 9 satellite passed through the beam from the Turkmenistan transmitter, which happened to be on a UHF frequency that matched one of its transponders, and the result was an unexpected bit of satellite TV. Mm. That's, that was apparently the actual original analog sort of uh, television, which is still used in Turkmenistan. Anyway, really interesting stuff and very relevant to tonight's evening with uh, propagation. And also from the same person, John M6JU, <coughs> excuse me, he said this. And he said he's glad that he liked us, the picture that he's done of made of his homemade slide scanner. He said it really does work perfectly, producing results as good as any pro unit. The white paper is important to point the assembly at for illumination. It's tempting to point it at the sky and it looks fine with the human eye, which automatically adjusts the colour. But take a photo and it will have a horrible blue cast. The copier works fine for negatives too, that might need a bit of DIY cardboard if the negatives are curly. John uses a bit of free GIMP software for Windows, which supposedly does most of what Photoshop does, including making negatives positive. And I think that was one of the things that Julian wanted to do. And anyway, the picture that you're looking at now was one that John took. It was one of his dad's 35 millimeter slides, which he's copied and put on. That is really good quality. I mean, I can tell you, I looked at the original that he sent. That was a picture actually taken in the early 1960s on really slow color film. So thanks, John. I, I really do think that we'll have some people out there trying to make themselves a, mm. a slide scanner. Yeah. Now, something for you Morse fans. Uh, you've got to watch it because it's only 16 seconds long, so be prepared, get comfortable to watch this. And by mm. the way, I will just mention something now, and I'll mention it again later. There's quite a few of you who are joining us on Zoom tonight because it's going to be an interactive. But if you are joining us on Zoom, you may not be aware that you can make the, the screen from whoever's talking uh, bigger and not just look at everybody in a small picture, including the pictures from us. So if you're one of those, instead of selecting gallery, select speaker. That's in the top right hand corner on your Zoom selection. I'm not, I know a lot of you know how to use Zoom and you will already know that, but it might be an idea to do it now because this is a lovely bit of video that we're going to show you now from James M0 UKS. Q Tammy. <laughs> Yep, that's it. <laughs> and that's from one of his own bird boxes. And he thought that was rather like Morse. I think he was bit trying like to remove Morse a code, cable yeah. clip, actually. I'll, took, I'll be issue, asked, took issue with it, didn't he? <laughs> I'll be asking um, Jim G through ILA when I was on Zoom or somebody else later to do, decode that. Maybe we'll be able to play it again, Tammy, if I don't put you on the spot too much about it. Anyway, they're the only two bits of news that we got, really, from people this week. So don't forget to still stay in touch, although we won't be using this sort of thing when we meet. Of course, we could, we'd love to use them on the NARC lives that we're going to have in between those real meetings. So don't forget to send it to the usual address, radio at dcpmicro.com. It's coming up the bottom of your screen yeah. now. <laughs> well rehearsed. Um, and uh, send it to us by Wednesdays at three o'clock. And we'd love to share just your news. And as you can see, it doesn't have to be about radio necessarily. It's just of general interest to other people. So keep in touch, as I said. But Tammy, every week you've been giving us a little people. Little people? Are you ready to show us yeah, what well, your little people is Yeah, well, as it was about weather week? and things tonight, I thought, well, we better go weathery. So here you go. Here's thunder. Oh, heck. So there's a bit of... That's brilliant. I know I always say we think this. So we've got cotton wool at the top, have we? No, it's clouds. Well, OK, clouds, sorry. And what's what could the bit underneath be? I'm not actually sure what it is, to be honest. As it's, it's a Japanese like site, could it be something like some fine, fine noodles? You know, like I, I think it is some kind of food. Yeah. yeah, I wonder if it's those noodles. But I don't know quite what, what they it call is. Them? Um, not rice noodles, they call those night noodles. There's a, a very fine what, noodle they use. Yeah, that sort of thing. There's a name for them. Anyway, I can't Making remember what it is. Making me hungry now. So, yeah, and me. I haven't had any <laughs> dinner yet. Right, well, yes, anyway, that, there we are. That's our tonight's little people. With a little, there are some little people at the bottom, or there's at least a little person there. Don't shelter underneath a tree. <laughs> if you'd like to look at any of those, miniature-calendar.com, a new picture every day, and Tammy picks one out for us every week. 
Okay. Now, as I said at the beginning, this what on earth is this? And it's every week. I'm 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 really not always sure about how many people are going to enter, and uh, I didn't know exactly what this was. So, Tammy, could we have a quick look at it, please? I know you're busy doing some other yep. things, but if we could just have a look at this. So, this is what we showed last week, and we and it was from Bob G Seven JTZ, and we asked, "What on earth is this?" And we've had loads of people. So, for the second, only the second time ever, I've had to put them on a whole new piece because our template for the script just didn't have enough room for it. So, here we go on a ride for them. Yeah, I must just say, oh, rice noodles someone's put, yes. Uh, or bean shoes. Right. Or bean shoes, could be. Yeah, it could be either of those. I think they call something else anyway. Glass noodles, maybe it's called glass noodles. Well, they're the see-through ones. Oh, anyway, anyway, look, back to the one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is what you all thought. I'm just checking that there's nobody else put anything here. No. So, Martin, M0XKM was first up, and he says, is it a professional balloon popper? Or a carrot planter? Or... A particularly nasty offensive wizard wand <laughs> but I think this is a serious entry or maybe a vintage grain sampler spear sack sampler I think he's just hedging his bets <laughs> I think he is yes well we'll see okay Neil G4JUV says it's a rope splice and spike also called a fid poke it into the rope and it creates a channel where the rope can be threaded through okay uh, James M0JGX says, one of those seed planting devices. Apologies for the terminology because I'm not a gardener. Uh, if not, maybe it's a letter opener. He's had hedging his bets as well. Mm. Tom GAXQD, uh, marine and naval use mainly, a Swedish fid for splicing rope. Useful for making terminations, joints and loops in twisted three-strand rope. Also, my tower captain uses a wooden version to adjust the church bell ropes to suit ringers at, at, of different heights. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, John G4ISS says, I use one of these in my other pastime, bell ringing. That links in, doesn't it? The one shown is known as a fid. It is scooped out along its length for ease of passing rope strands to aid splicing bell ropes. There's a solid version as well called a marlin spike. Uh, Tony G0LIF says, I think it's a rope splicer or not. G John G8VP says, I think it's for sampling grain from a hessian sack. Where I lived when I was a young lad, we had many maltings very close by, where they constantly had barley delivered for turning into malted barley for the brewing industry. That's why you live there, John, isn't it? <laughs> in those early days before bulk deliveries, nearly all the grain was delivered in open lorries in huge sacks and it was quite common to see these sacks being sampled. Uh, Dave M0UDB um, says it's a marlin spike. Okay I just see I'm just going to keep an eye as well on the social media and Andrew uh, uh, M0NKR says it's a splicing tool. Um, sorry Tammy which one did you do then? You're, you're on Jeff. Oh Jeff. Jeff G0DDX says it's a rope work tool for splicing. Push the tool under the strand of the rope, slide the end of the strand of rope down the V section, remove the tool, pull tight, and repeat until the splice has been completed. Gordon G3PXT, um, it's an eye spice tool for rope. And Kevin M0UJD says, I think it's a device for helping to thread up a sewing machine. What? <laughs> How did that get through? <laughs> well, disregard that. Uh, Colin M0GMK, I think this week's mystery object is a bead scoop. Oh, huh? bead scoop. Oh, yes, I can see that. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Mike G8EY says, the latest what is this for is called a Swedish fid. Swedish fids are used for splicing three-strand anchor plate and other octoplate ropes. They can also be useful for extracting the core when splicing braided ropes. Uh, Roy G8IXM says, I think that this week's object is a splicing fid, sometimes called a Dutch fid, which is a tool used in rope splicing to enable a strand to be fed through the lay of the ropes. P.S. Or it could be an obscure tool for threading that dreaded sewing machine. <gasps> Just a <for> thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I don't think no. <laughs> Simon M0EBN says this is a Swedish fid used to spice rope because I use them all the time. Uh, Bruce G4KZT, I think this week's what on earth is it, is a gardening tool, a combined dibber and seed planter. Holding the wooden handle, you push the sharp end in the soil, 
then drop a seed down the slot in the side. When removed, the soil will fall back in the hole, covering the seed. Job done. Alternatively, could it be a ground stake for a sewing machine? No, no, <laughs> it's not. No, sure, I know we shouldn't give it away yet, but surely it can't be a ground stake for a sewing machine, surely. <laughs> Mike M Zero TVG. I believe that this week's mystery tool is for opening the strands of a rope to enable splicing to be carried out, such as to splice two lengths together or to form an eye in the end around a thimble. I've made such splices in my boating past. Uh, Simon M0 SIH says the item featured on what on earth is a Swedish fid. It's used to open the strands on a rope. The strands are slid into the V channel on the fid so that they can be tucked back on themselves when splicing an eye in a rope. I used to use one when I had a boat a few years ago. Nearly there. Tony M0 TDK says this week's mystery object is a tool for splicing rope. These things used to be called a fid made of wood or a marlin spike if they're made of steel. The version shown is a type designed to be used for splicing mantled rope. That is rope with a woven and outer sheath or a mantle. It could be used for splicing any other type of rope, although it would struggle with steel wire rope. Uh, Tony, 2E0BDB, I think this week's mystery object is a fid, which is used to splice both fibre or wire rope. And, uh, well, I, I better just tell you now, it won't surprise you probably because that most people did think it was one of these. It is called a, a Swedish fit from Bob G7JTZ. As you know, Bob will know that he is a keen scouter and he sent that in. And I love the variety of an ingenuity of people, what they thought, because I could well believe it was used for putting seeds in. You even thought that, didn't you? That was my thought, yeah. Yeah, when you first saw it. Like so, a dibba type thing. Yeah, well done to all of you. Um, Sunny M0SYW actually on uh, BATC says that it's, uh, I think I've even witnessed Mr. JTZ using it. So there we are. Anyway, well done to all of you. Enter, thank you very much. It gives us entertainment. And uh, well done to Bob especially, because you foxed some people, but others knew what it was. Wonderful stuff. So we're ready for this week's object. Now, have a good look at this. What on earth is this? You might need a close look at this. And we'll put it, of course, on our website and on Facebook and on the newsletter this weekend. <laughs> I don't want to confuse you. This is this week's, but uh, we've had a, a comment from um, from the... Um, Partner in crime. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of it. It is. Uh, tiredness has taken over. Um, the um, gang. What are they called? The Summer Wine Gang. The Summer gang. Wine Gang. Yes, that's right. Paul G3VPT says... Well, Bob did serve with Lord Nelson. <laughs> so, I bet you know how to use one of those. Anyway, back to that picture again. Sorry. Oh, Karen. you want to go back to I the picture? I should have gone back to the okay. picture. Sorry. We just, we just don't want to leave out people that make nice comments. In there. there we go. There it is. As I said, it will be on Facebook, on our newsletter, and on the website. What on earth is that? So, just as having a look at what's happening next week on the club, uh, or this coming week, Sunday on at 7 o'clock, on G the GB2RS News on GB3 NB Repeater. On Monday, it's the Monday Night Net at half past seven with Tim M1 MIT, and that's on GB3 NB. Really looking for other people now to volunteer because Tim is the one who coordinates all this together, um, but it's not fair for him to run it every week. So if you would like to run the net, if you take part in that net, just, just occasionally just run it and it helps to keep it all fresh as well. Uh, so that's Monday night, and at half past eight on Monday night, the 80 meter CW net on 3.543 megahertz as well. Then next Wednesday, here, we're here on NARC Live, it's Anthony K8ZT with Ham Radio Life Beyond Repeaters. And I'm intrigued on that picture. Uh, that's the picture we've got for him, though. Obviously, coming to us live from the States, but that's all about ham radio life beyond repeaters. So, do we need repeaters, I guess, and all that sort of thing? That's happening next week on Not Live. And don't forget, as I said, please keep sending us your news because it really does help make this first bit of the program. And uh, don't forget as well that we do send this card to anybody you think will be cheered up by it, whether they've got a birthday celebration, not feeling so good. And we have a sympathy version, sympathy card version of it as well. Just drop us a line to the usual address, radio at dcpmicro.com, and we will sign this card, include your name, and send it to wherever you would like us to do. 
So now we're on to tonight's main event. Now, as we called it, it's, it's a series really that we do occasionally called In the Shack. It's looking at all sort of aspects of the shack and it's aimed at beginners to the hobby, a lot of which have joined in the last couple of years in particular, um, and the club hasn't been able to meet and, and help them. But also it's aimed at all of us because we'd all, I think we'd all agree we learn something new every day and it's great to share that knowledge and help people. Well, we were asked by Steve M7 CNI to, to or suggested that we actually talked about um, propagation because it was a bit of a mystery, especially if you've just done your foundation, can't go into much detail there. And it's a bit of a confusion about what it is. And yet clearly it's so important. And if you know which bands are gonna be alive and which ones you can do, then propagation is the, is the secret, especially if you can forecast it. So tonight we're gonna to talk about propagation. We want your questions either on BATC or Facebook or even better, I can see we've got now how many people? Um, 12. About eight, 12 people joining us on Zoom as well, which is wonderful. Because I hope they'll have something to contribute or some questions to ask as well. That's what it's all about. We've also got Jim G through YLA, who's going to be showing us one of the tools that's available out there, an excellent tool called PropQuest, which he helped develop. And he'll be showing that and giving us a live demonstration of that as well later on. But we'd love to, some questions. And I'm, if it's all right, I'm gonna, I did see that Steve was there, M7C and I, and he's the one who posed this. So if it's all right, Steve, I'm going to put you on the spot and invite you in first on Zoom. And uh, nice to meet you for the first time, I think, as well. And maybe you'd like to unmute and then tell us what you'd like to know first about propagation. Yeah, good evening, all. Um, basically, it's a case of I'm seeing all this different information that's available. Oh. But they don't really understand what there is. Can you hear me, David? Uh, a little bit broken, to be honest, Steve. So we got most of that, I think. You, you've seen all the information about it. Um, what exactly, what specifically would you like to know about propagation, just to start us off? Well, I understand propagation is about how radio waves bounce around the globe and everything else. But when you start looking at things like PropQuest, you don't really understand what you're actually looking at on the screen. Um, I've tried looking at that one along with one or two others, but unfortunately, I'm, give, I'm seeing information but don't really understand what he's trying to tell me and where to go and have a look and see what I can find. Okay, now that's, that's very concise. Thank you very much for that. Well, although um, I wasn't intending to maybe go there first thing, I think to answer your question directly, we do need to go to Jim, G3YLA, who I know has got a version of uh, PropQuest with him as well. So Jim, can I come to you, maybe before we look at the PropQuest tool, can you give us a, an, an overview to try and answer some of what Steve has, has asked for there? Yeah, yeah, well, good evening everybody and um, welcome to you, Steve. And, and, and it's really good to get questions from folk rather than struggling with something. And, and because this is a, uh, a, a sort of an amateur developed thing, it's not something that necessarily appears in the propagation handbooks and things like that. Um, you, you probably have heard of ionosons, where you have these stations that transmit a signal vertically upwards and you increase the frequency until it doesn't come back down again. And that's the critical frequency of the layer up in the ionosphere that you're bouncing your signal off. So it's a measurement technique. And there aren't many of these places in the world. There's you know, two or three dozen or so, I would think, uh, perhaps a bit more than that, actually, probably about 50 altogether scattered around the whole globe. Now, when you look at those, they appear as quite sort of involved, complicated looking graphs, and they give you a snapshot at the latest time uh, that a reading was taken. But when we're on the amateur bands, um, the conditions are changing all the while, and um, it has a typical behavior going through the 24 hours which more or less repeats every day. So the Don't nice know. thing occurred to me, it would be good to devise a system whereby we could plot the behaviour of the ionosphere somewhere locally to us. Uh, in this case, there's a site at Chilton near Oxford, and there's another one at Fairford near, near um, Gloucester. And um, those two sites in southern England are the ones that are deemed sort of appropriate for uh, conditions in the UK. Now, the point is, you can get this data from a big data server in the States, 
and download it and then plot it on a graph. So it's possible to display the whole thing through a 24 hour cycle. And not just for today, you can look back to other days or even other years and you can come up with all sorts of other useful statistics. So the key thing, Steve, is that by making it available on PropQuest, you can see where you are in the cycle through the day. And depending on what the graph shows, you can see which bands are likely to be open at, at the time you look at it or earlier in the day when you're operating. The reason, uh, and this is just the last bit of the answer, the reason um, I had to play with this and, and developed it along with my programming colleague, Dan Holly at WeatherQuest, uh, who's done a lot of all the work on the programming side. Um, the, the idea is that, say, if we have a local net on 80 metres, uh, and we do, in fact, have one on a Monday night, we have a club net, and some weeks it's successful, some weeks it's not. And the same for the 80 metre contests. And it was of great interest to us to know what made one week different to the previous one. And when you look at these graphs, you're able to see what that is. So before I go on to a whole load of detail about those, I'll just uh, put it back to you and you can, uh, to David, and he can see if there are any other questions in a, in a general sense like that. Mm. All right, lovely, Jim. Thank you ever so much for that. Um, and a whole wealth of knowledge. Um, I'm going to go to Steve now just to see has that helped a little bit, it, uh, you know, uh, unveil the mystery behind why we use PropQuest type tools. Yes and no. Um, I'm looking at the graphs on the screens and I'm thinking, right, what am I actually looking at with those graphs? Are the little coloured lines of dots the actual frequencies where you're going to get more information on um, as to when you need to look at those particular bands? Jim? Right. Yeah, well, that, that, that's the nub of it. And I was going to come on to that part of the uh, answer because it's where it gets to be more detailed. Um, are you see? No, you're not. I'm not sharing my screen at the moment, am I, David? No, you can do that, though, if you like. And it just right. again, and while you're doing that, Jim, if I can, um, and we're going to show you uh, Jim's screen in a second to everybody else watching on Facebook and BATC. Um, but if I can uh, just remind you, those of you who are on the Zoom call, um, Rather than just appear as one another small box on there, if you're looking at the gallery view, that's what you'll see at the moment. But if you go to speaker view, and that's normally an option in the top right hand corner, if you select that with your mouse, then you'll you'll get a large picture of whoever's speaking, um, which will obviously be in a moment will be Jim speaking over that. And I think you'll find that particularly useful if you're going to look at the PropQuest sc screen in a minute. But I think Tammy, now we can show uh, the PropQuest screen. So go ahead, Jim, please. Yeah, OK, right. Well, to, to everybody watching who hasn't sort of delved into PropQuest, the main thing uh, that shows the graphs that people look at on a day by day basis comes on this tab up here. It's called it's labeled FOF2. And that stands for the critical frequency of the ordinary ray. And I won't go into the details of that. You get two sorts of rays that are refracted by the ionosphere. One is the ordinary ray and one is the extraordinary ray. And, and, and the important thing is to get a tracker to show how things have changed. So this FOF2, this F2 bit here at the, um, at, at the end of that title tells you we're looking at the F layer. So these red dots, when you hover a mouse over the dots, you'll see you've got uh, what the critical frequency is of the FOF2. So if you go down to the, well, first of all, at the top of the box, there's the time of the observation. So here it says 1600, the date. It tells you that it's Chiltern, which is that site near Oxford. And the, um, OK, I'll start from the bottom of that tooltip box and work upwards. The FOEs is the critical frequency of the sporadic E layer. So that's printed up at two point seven five megahertz so you're getting reflections back uh, at 2.75 megahertz from the sporadic e that's there um, now if you sent a signal up that was higher than that it wouldn't come back it would go straight through so we then have a look at the next higher layer which is the reading for the fof2 now this is what happens if you send a signal straight up and you get a reflection back down and you keep increasing the frequency until it doesn't come down. And that gives you your FOF2. And at this time, at 1600, 
it was 6.27 megahertz. So you would hear a signal, um, you, you wouldn't hear a signal um, uh, coming back, um, say, straight above your head on 14 megahertz necessarily. But, but, but if, you look at, if you look at this, anything up to 6.27 megahertz, you'd get back. So, so this is a straight up and down value. Now, what most amateurs do, most amateurs don't use the ionosphere to signal, send a signal straight up and back down again to somebody at the other end of the village. You'd use ground wave for that. So, so this isn't for very, very local contact, Steve. This is, this is for signals that are coming from farther away. Because the farther away you go, and that's why these labels above this are labeled as, you'll see the next one above it is labeled 100 kilometers. So if you went 100 kilometers away and bounced your signal up and down again, you could get a signal of 6.9 megahertz. So that's a little bit higher in frequency. But at this time, if you went to 500 kilometers away, you could use 7.54 megahertz. So it would support a higher frequency. So the shallower the angle that you meet the F layer, and we're on the F2 layer now, the shallower the angle, the higher the frequency you can use. So on this occasion, the, the upper value is uh, a 3000 kilometer path, which is typical really, um, Steve, for most DX, you know, when you have these multi-hop paths going around the globe. So, so, so the one closest to Southern England suggests that the 3000 kilometer hop would be supported up to 21 megahertz. Now, if we look at the graph here during the day, you'll see from sunrise, which is where it changes color. I don't know if you can pick that out at home. It goes from a light gray to a bright orange color. From sunrise, um, or just a fraction before sunrise, in fact, the um, values are already starting to come up because the sun hits the ionosphere before it hits the surface. You know, the ionosphere being higher up has its sunrise a bit earlier. Anyway. It's, it's only a matter of a few minutes or so. So anyway, this is starting to increase because the ionosphere is getting solar radiation in the ultraviolet and it's creating the ionization that will eventually be useful enough to us to support the bands. Now, coming across here, these dotted green lines, uh, do they show up at home, the horizontal dotted lines? They're labeled with the different bands. Yeah, we've got some thumbs ups from people yeah, watching good. Zoom. So, I so, think, yeah. so once this curve or these dots go above the band that you're interested in, that means that that band should be open if you're looking at a hop over southern Britain near where this site is. Now, what you have to bear in mind is that um, as you say, go across the Atlantic to the States in the afternoon, the sun is only just, you know, sunrise in the Midwest, you know, when we're having our afternoon um, fine, sunny, warm weather. It's just getting to be sunrise. So most of the path now to the States would be in daylight. And some of these Western points where you're bouncing off the ionosphere at the state side, it's where you have a two hot one, just to keep it simple. The first one near Southern Britain would be well and truly up here at the top and we could use 21 megs possibly even 24 megs on this. Um, so, so, so the first one closest to us will be better represented by these curves. The one further across the Atlantic will be back here on its, because it's all about the local solar noon. So that will be back here somewhere and it might not support such a high frequency as the one close in. So that's why as the, as the day progresses, the afternoon progresses, you hear the stateside signals on the east coast getting stronger as their curves come up to match this. And you'll notice that here locally, once we get in this region, it sort of burbles about at a fairly high value. So 21 megs should be open, 18 megs should be open, 14 megs should be open. So all these bands in here should be open. And then what you see is during the evening, everything sort of falls away again because the sun isn't shining on the ionosphere anymore and the ionization is, is weakening. So the paths close down and you just left with residual ionization for long distance um, LF paths uh, on, on 80 meters and 40 meters. And you get those 
during the night time. Because the other thing is when these um, ionization levels get too strong, the, the LF bands get absorbed. So your signal won't go through from 80 and 40. So you're just during the daytime restricted to local QSOs on ground wave on 80 and 40 and top band. But at night, when the D layer absorption has decayed away and the sun's no longer shining on the D layer, then you can get these long skip paths to the states on 80 and 40 and, and top band as well, all around the world, really. There's no limit to where you can go. So to, to, to get back to the nub of the question, Steve, these curves represent the bands that are likely to be open for the longest distance hop, the shallowest angle, which is the top curve. And then as you come down in the curves to the next orange one down here, that is a steeper path. So it's a lower frequency. And as you come lower down on the curves, you're finding your, your hop closes in and closes in and closes in. Now, if you listen to a band like 80 meters, you'll be able to see, if I just refresh this to get the very latest on here, you'll see we're comfortably above 80 meters here. We're at about five, uh, we're about 6.25 megahertz. So 80 meters should be going very well. And we haven't started the decay yet. So if I look at the, um, if I look at the signals on the band, you'll see there's some fairly strong signals about here, which, um, you know, would be, could be anywhere in Europe or the UK. That's a, that's a Dutch station in Holland. So, so, so he's doing very well because he's been able to send a signal up from Holland, which is quite close by. But, but when you think when you're steeper, you go into it, the more likely it is to go straight through. The fact is, we know from this graph that this FOF2, this, this figure at the bottom of that little toolbox there, 6.25 megahertz is above, well above 3.5 megahertz. So you get a nice strong signal from the Dutch station. So, so what, what you can do is look at this and it, how it follows during the day. So let me just do one last thing and then I'll pop it back to you. This archive tab on here, this is always the latest one. The archive tab shows you what it did yesterday. And you can see after sunrise, you start to get it tailing away and these curves come down. Now at this time of the year, sometimes it goes below 3.5 megs and 80 meters packs up, sometimes it doesn't. But this is the way to see how much longer you've got before the band goes away and it won't support a ref refraction back from, from um, a 3.5 meg signal. So, so those are the two key ones. Today's value is what we've got now and you just press this every now and again to refresh it. But if you want to see what it was like last Monday, you can just go in here and pick the, pick the date and, and have a look. So a week ago, we can go and have a look and we can see that it looks slightly different. It did get down to 3.5 megs later in the day. Um, you can also compare today with yesterday. So if you go onto the compare tab here, you can see, um, let me, I can't see the, um, there it is. Uh, so Wednesday is the red. So today is red and the bands don't look quite so good today. These values are lower than they were yesterday at the same time. So that can tell you why things aren't quite as good as they were yesterday if you were on the bands. When I was on a contest at lunchtime, it felt as if it was a bit, a bit sort of down on the days before when I'd been listening. And that sort of confirmed by this. Anyway, did, did that help at all, Steve? Yes, that helped a lot. Thank you very much, Jim. It really did, because all I kept seeing was these coloured lines going across the graph. I'm looking at it and trying to work out what it actually is trying to tell me just having it simply explained the way you just have has helped me understand what i'm now looking at and it was well when you look at it and you sort of for the first time and you're sort of trying to get your head around what you're actually looking at i was getting so baffled with all the information i was thinking for some reason the the different colored lines meant something else um the fact it's sort of literally showing you what's the best option at that point in time that now makes sense yeah and if you have a look at the legend down at the bottom of the curve yeah you, you can see it tells you which curves are which here 
Now, now, if it's too cluttered for you, then supposing you were listening on 80 and you, were, you weren't hearing any UK stations, but you were just, say, hearing German stations, why not switch some of these off? Um, so we can switch that one off, we can switch that one off, we can switch that one off, we can switch that one off. And uh, let's, let's take that one off. And then you've got your 500 kilometre path on its own. And you can see clearly what's going on. So you can you can unclutter it if you wish to see to see what's what's going on. So basically, everything you need to see how a particular day is unfolding is there. And not only that, you can compare it to yesterday using this for the FOF two. Yeah. And um, you can have a look at a day a week ago and see how it was for a net you had last week or on this compare thing you can put different dates in here you could look at what it's what the difference is i'll tell you what let's do um let's do uh i can't remember the exact date but this is going to be near enough so if i we haven't had 20 20, 20 so this is rough fifth of oops it needs to be june doesn't it let's say the first weekend in june i don't know when it is let's have a look oh well i wasn't far off so saturday was um, HFNFD, so so that's just midsummer when when things should be in good shape. Let's see how that compares with the state of the ionosphere today. Now, isn't that interesting? There it is, right there for you. You've got today's values in red, and Saturday, the first day of the HFNFD, in blue. And you can get these big, huge differences. And that's one of the things that, that people tend to sort of not be in a position to see and review. You, you, you've got to accept that the ionosphere is even more sort of detailed and complicated than probably the weather is, if truth be told. There's all sorts of ionisation up there swirling about and in a right old state of disorganization and the fact that it gets layered as much as it does is really helpful to we amateurs but it can vary enormously and even here you can see on some days there's lots of spikiness going on and up on the top here you can look at different stations so here we're looking at Chilton I can I think do this one and um, compare the values from um, Fairford now it turns out that Fairford isn't operating today so we don't have that one. Uh, Dorbs is in Belgium. So we can have a look at that and we can see again, there's a big difference. Some of these plot slightly differently because this one measures every uh, 10 minutes, whereas others measure every 15 minutes. So, so there's a bit of um, uh, difference in how the line looks. But, but you know, we get these out of the goodness of the hearts of the system that does the professional measurement and research. So I this program uh, uh, goes off to the American data server, extracts the data and makes it available in our little way. So we don't get hundreds of amateurs all piling into the professional research server and overloading it with lots of queries. This is a way of keeping tabs on it without, without lots of accesses. And um, you can see there's, there's three that you can choose from. So it's very rare that they all go offline unless there's a problem with the server in the States. And then we just have to wait for it to be fixed. But I'm usually in email contact with them pretty regularly. So we can usually find out what's going on. It's nearly always a computer upgrade and, and things like that, Steve. Yeah. I'll say one of the things I hadn't realized was that by clicking on the um, identifiers down the bottom, that you could actually reduce the amount of data that was on the screen. Yeah. Um, that was something I hadn't discovered. Um, when we were talking on um, the radio the other week, um, you said about the help files. I've actually been looking for those and I couldn't find them. You see this thing up the top here that says about. We're just going to put it on now. OK. And there you have all the different subject headings for the different bits of PropQuest. Right. And these are all the, all the comments that were written to explain what goes on. So here's the one about the ionosons and and what they mean and things like this yeah i don't actually found those but i didn't realize they were the the help files i was actually looking for oh i see yeah well that's all there is on <laughs> <It's> only, um 
Anyway, Let's Steve, I, ho I hope um, I'm not trying to uh, shut it down, but I, I'm aware that we've got about 70 people also watching this. So, uh, but Steve, thank you for uh, encouraging us to do this because it's really because of that that um, you know we're doing what we're doing tonight. Um, and and of course we'll be able to talk to you later on as well. But I hope you don't mind that I go to some other people now and ask them uh, for questions. So everybody at home now on BATC or Facebook. You can type your questions in and we'll read them to Jim. And we've got one to read in a moment. Uh, and also, of course, on Zoom, we'd like to come to you as well to get some interaction. It's not just Jim. I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying this. You know, he's offered to be here tonight to be able to take us through that. But we'd like to hear what your experiences are as well. Uh, it's all about sharing information. So I've got a question, Jim, while you've still got the computer on there and everything. Uh, and I, I will just read this to you. This is on Facebook from... Uh, Simon M zero T R J who says what options oh. are for white stick operators using a screen reader software? Thanks. Is that so? Is there any way that you can use PropQuest? I guess if you're if you're blind or partially sighted. That's a really good question, Simon. And nice to hear from you, by the way. It's a long while since we've um, sat there playing with the Morse key up at the Marconi sessions. Um, so trust you well. And um, judging by the question, I assume you've got some eyesight issues and um, I, I'm not absolutely sure how well I've never looked into it. If, if I'm quite honest, I have not uh, explored that. I, I don't know how well these sight reading bits of software are at decoding graphical content. That would be my, my query. Um, I'm not quite sure how that would work. And, and so therefore we haven't, I'd have to confess, we haven't designed this in any way, shape or form to be particularly good or bad for partially sighted folk. It's just not been something that we've considered um, uh, doing. Um, I guess it's largely it, visual as well, Jim. It, well, problems, it is, unfortunately. It? Yes. it is, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, one of the problems with the work with, with PropQuest is that um, although I've been sort of laying out the schematic of it and, and what I want to see and things like that, driven by my amateur radio connections, um, the, the fact is it depends on the good auspices and, and magnificent unrewarded help of a colleague of mine at work, Dan Holly, who does the programming for the website. And it comes very much as a favour to me that he does these jobs as and when he gets time. Now, he's really uh, up against it with work stuff at the moment, hugely busy. So I'm really lucky to get uh, access to his uh, skills when he can spare them. So th there isn't a mechanism for people to say, we want this in the system and can we have it by next Thursday? That isn't how it works. It works purely on a voluntary basis. And uh, there is an area that we're currently developing. This, this site has certainly not stood still since it came online. It's continually being developed. And the last area that we're finishing up with is the EPI index up here, which I'm sure we'll get onto in a, in a while. Sure, thank you. Thanks, Jim. I hope that's helped. Simon, nice to hear from you as well, from me. So, um, Jim, I think at the moment, if I can ask you not to share your screen, it's just that yeah. everybody at home on Zoom only, uh, we can't, we've got no control over that. So that's all they'd see at that moment. Um, I, I just like, sorry. Back. You got it back, have you? We have, I think, yeah. So everybody at home now should be able to see other people and um, see what we're putting out as well. So do keep coming with those questions. We've got uh, a, a comment coming here from Doug, 2E0YWP, and says, uh, if yesterday was better than today, can I ask why? I thought the warmer weather was better because yesterday was a bit cooler. Okay, well, the, the ionosphere tends to be affected more by um, radiation from the sun in terms of coronal mass ejections or ultraviolet and also the dynamics of how the atmosphere rearranges the ionization that is there um, so how warm it feels at the surface has to be honest absolutely no bearing on the state of the ionosphere they're totally de de decoupled in that sense it's much more about um, whether what the solar flux index is things like that, those sorts of parameters, whether there's been an aurora, whether there's been a coronal mass ejection, those are the things that make it different. And, 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 and one of the, one of the, um, uh, one of the main features of this is, is, is that this data is the data that's freely available from the um, uh, Ionason data server over in the States. 
So, so it's the easiest stuff for me to get hold of to make visible. There, there will be huge long wish lists, lists, but as you've seen, the graphs do get quite complicated. So, um, I'm sure that that w we could have wish lists of all sorts of things. I thought I saw something about the FOE layer or so. We do the FOEs when there is E's, which is the purple line, but we don't do the E layer in and of itself or the D layer. That might be something that we add in at some stage, but at the moment it's sporadic E that's more important because the ordinary background E region uh, and the D region um, tend not to be of significance to us, other than the D region absorbs LF signals going through it. So we don't hear the LF bands doing very well during the daytime. No, lovely. All right, Jim, thank you. I'm afraid I know you didn't want to be the centre of tonight, um, but I think because you're probably our, almost certainly our resident expert, I think a lot of the questions are going to be come to you. And I've got John, G4NEY, actually. Although he's typed some questions out, I think it'd be nice, John, if you don't mind to hear them from you um, in person. So uh, if you'd like to unmute and we'll come to you and then you can ask questions of Jim or and with it, of anybody else. Oh, hi, hi, Jim. Um, it's G4NEY, John, over in uh, Willingham near Cambridge. Oh, hello, John. Um, yeah, I, I, we, we have met before. Um, but uh, the question that I've got was about the E, actually, uh, the critical frequency. How's that related to um, sporadic E? I'm not yeah. sure of that. And, okay. uh, um, some other um, questions there are also, have you, in fact, was, have you got any impla uh, plans to include uh, more I on Sun data from the server in, in the States? Okay, um, well, two great questions, John. And um, the, the E region um, does not really affect propagation in the way that makes it a value on a crowded graph, if you see what I mean. That there is a separate characteristic um, in the Ionason list of FOE as opposed to FOEs. Now, E's is the sporadic E layer, which becomes dense enough to refract a signal on VHF or the high HF bands and so on. So sporadic E is a focusing of ionization that happens to be in the E region, but isn't composed, as I understand it, of the normal stuff that the E region is composed. The E region happens because of solar radiation. As the sun comes up higher, you get solar radiation that gets stronger, and it ionizes the E region, the, the, the air molecules, the gas molecules up there. And as it sets, it decays again as things reabsorb. They have relative, individually, they have relatively short life cycles. So while the sun is coming up, there's a constant supply of new ionization. And then as it goes down, the profit and loss count means that the, the values decrease pretty quickly. So the E layer and the D layer behave um, <clears throat> as almost true Chapman layers, they call them, which is after the physicist who defined ones that are related to the solar elevation angle. Sporadic E, on the other hand, is composed of long-lived metallic ions, which happen when meteors burn up in the upper atmosphere in sort of E region, and they um, uh, produce ionization that can last in the order of a day or two. You know, it's it's significantly longer than something that varies with the uh, solar elevation. So the thing is, this stuff is up there floating about from the, imagine a path of a meteor going through, and there's this trail of ionization, which then a bit like cigarette smoke in the bar, you know, you walk through the bar and it wafts about and it isn't particularly c c connected to anything. But, but sporadic E, because of how it forms, you can get wind shear up there, which will focus it into a narrow, denser layer, which is what gives you your sporadic E patch. Right. And, and the E's ionization is composed of different stuff to the E region ionization, which is the ionization of the gas molecules up there, whereas the sporadic E stuff is composed of these long lived, they call metallic ions, magnesium, silica, things like that. My confusion, Jim, was. But yeah, you know, in my mind, um, going back a long way, that I'd look at the critical frequency on the F layer and say, well, OK, um, the MUF will be about four times that. And generally, that seems about right. My confusion was looking at the 
um, but you know, the, the low frequency effective, the FOE value, and thinking, well, how do I relate that to um, sporadic E, or do I not, can I not relate it? Well, 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 and, and they, they are different different things produced by different mechanisms. So, so probably best not to try and relate them. But, but, but to give you some scaling figures, um, I haven't got the particular laptop connected that's got some graphs on, but I'm sure that will appear on some talk or other coming up. But, but basically, the the sporadic e ionization values, um, the FOEs, can go from about sort of five megs ish when it starts to get interesting up to 18 even 20 megahertz and and from studies i've done over the last two or three years admittedly this is a bit of a ballpark thing so it's back of the envelope thing but for things like um cw and ssb i would work on a factor of about eight times okay and for things like ft8 it turns out to be about 10 times so you can see how you can quickly get up to the sort of VHF bands where these things happen because it's a much denser. This isn't like a, a normal F layer or E layer ionization where it's a gradual. These are very sharp boundaries sometimes. So, so they have a much more effective sort of um, bending coefficient and they can give you, in, in fact, there's arguments that some might be actually a specular reflection. From, from it, but 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 it, it's it's so dense it looks and feels a bit more like that. But but it's it's it, in my mind it's still a refraction that goes on. But but it's super intense, and and what you'll find is that the ionosons don't actually use it because it's pretty he's dotted about all over this job. Um, we've been very lucky if a really super intense patch of sporadic E sat right on top of one of these ionosan stations. In all the years I've been looking at them, I've never seen one get above about 14 megahertz. But it clearly, it clearly must, because when you look at the value of the FOEs and relate that to, to what you're seeing on DX maps plotted as sporadic E paths, you can come up with a ballpark sort of, sort of issue of what it might be. That's a great, that's a fantastic answer, Jim. That's really helped a lot. Thank you very much indeed. And thank, well, thank you very much for the question, John, as well. Uh, I'm sure others have, have got uh, questions for you. Uh, before we move on to those, and maybe we'll go to some of those uh, people now watching on Zoom as well, maybe they've got some uh, questions or some experiences to share. Um, a message for Jim from Rick M7 GMT who says, hi Jim, just like to reiterate my offer of some development time on PropQuest or even hosting if needed. It's a fantastic tool and would love to give something back. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Rick. Well, that's, uh, that's really kind of you. And um, should, should we get to the stage where we've got to do something really quickly and we haven't got the resources? I mean, I'm very lucky at the moment having Dan on hand. But next time we meet up at a rally or a club meeting, it'll be very interesting to have a chat. But uh, at the moment, we're sort of doing what we can where we can. Um, my current development work consists mainly of, of doing some Python programming and such like to try and evaluate. Um, uh, I didn't go into this because this isn't a talk on sporadic E, but, 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 but essentially what makes the ionization come together for sporadic E uh, are things driven by tidal winds in the, in the ionosphere and um, wave motions projecting up from weather systems in the weather bit. And I'm trying to um, uh, resolve the uncertainties about where in the weather world we generate the right sort of triggers to make sporadic E, because you know sporadic E doesn't happen everywhere. And, and one of the geographical forcings for sporadic E is connected to weather in some way. And, and currently the work is a sort of behind the scenes extracting data from the eye on the suns and relating it to data feeds from the mathematical weather models to try and see which parameters are more important. And then that will in turn feed back into the sporadic E stuff we put up on the E's blog and the EPI map, which I'll talk about in a, in a little while. Lovely, Jim, thank you. Uh, a comment from uh, Henry, M0ZE, who's also on Zoom. I don't know if you want to come Henry. on Zoom as well. Um, but uh, he's just put a note here saying voacap.com is also a good tool. 
Um, Absolutely. Which I'm sure you're not you're not saying that uh, PropQuest is the be all and end all. And I know you you and Steve G Zero K Y also encourage people to look at lots of different tools, like life, really, isn't it? You, there's yeah, probably yeah, no well, one perfect tool, and there's lots of different things. Yeah, to... well, they, that's absolutely right. And it's important to say that they do do slightly different things. So, so VoaCap is looking at the conditions for a whole path, which could be several hops going across the Atlantic or going across Europe into Asia and all the rest of it. I'm just plotting data from one ionosond and looking at the conditions going straight up. And OK, you can infer things farther afield if you can, in your mind's eye, see how how the ionisation levels will change, because that curve that you see there it, it, as a first as a first order sort of solution, you can just say, OK, if 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 we're in the middle of the day in the UK and looking at a UK ionosond halfway across the Atlantic, it'll be sort of mid morning on our curve and and over on the state side of the path it, it might be just at the sunrise bit so you can piece together in your mind's eye that you you won't have a path where all the hops reflect refracting back from the f layer have the same quality to them they don't they'll all be at different stages of their evolution along that curve so VoaCap looks at the path in toto which is which is what you need for hf propagation Whereas this looks at explaining things more on a local basis and why, for example, the local 80 meter CW net some days just falls off the edge of a cliff and some days doesn't. And, and it's, uh, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do some other tabs on here. I'll show you something which we've been collecting for a while and, and, and explain that in a moment. But, but, but it's all about what's happening locally on PropQuest. So they're designed to do different things. But we're, we're lucky in the amateur radio world, aren't we, that we have so many really good packages out there that are free to use that tell us a lot about the bit that really matters to amateur radio, you know, the bit, the bit that controls how our signals move around the world. And um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of folk who, who come into amateur radio and don't go beyond the, oh, well, the band is open or it's not open. Uh, and, and you gain so much more by finding out a bit more about why it's doing what it's doing. And you can, when you look at these graphs on here and you relate that to what you hear on your receiver and you see that the line is tipping through some of those green band markers, you'll suddenly hear signals being confined to the longer distances. So instead of hearing a really good into G net, you know, for the sake of argument, I don't know, WAB net or something, and everybody's really loud and all the mobiles whizzing around the UK can all hear each other and everything. And then when the ionization falls away, it's only the signals coming in at shallower angles. So you suddenly find you only hear the stations from Scotland or, or Ireland coming in. And then eventually they go and you only hear people from halfway across Germany coming in. And that's when you're moving up the curves and you're not using the FOF2 curve for local natters within 100 kilometres of the station you want to work. But you're looking at these more expanded curves, which puts you on to those higher lines on the graph. And, and that will tell you which, um, which distance is still above 3.5 megs. And that should give you a reason for why you're hearing southern german stations as opposed to southern england stations yeah it's excellent and as you said jim we're very lucky in this hobby to have so many resources most of them completely free i mean not just for propagation for all sorts of things it's amazing i think probably because we are a technical type subject i guess and there are people with the ability to be able to apply that to to give everybody and share tools with everybody so it's, it's really good um, just like to go to people at home now on Zoom and just uh, if anybody would like to come on now, would you give us a wave or a thumbs up or something? I can see several people there. Tony, uh, M0 TDQ, uh, TDK, sorry, um, over to you. Am I, am I live? You are live, yes. Yeah, it's my plug came out a few minutes ago, so I disappeared. Um, yes, I mean, I, I, I love PropQuest. There are other tools which you could argue are easier to understand. I don't think they are, but you can see why people might think that. I mean, the reverse beacon network is particularly interesting um, because you can see what what's heard in real time there. Um, and of course, Whisper, you know, the um, weak signal propagation reporter. Those two tools, which are things I tend to use, 
probably a little more than PropQuest, but they're actually very interesting. I mean, I don't know whether I'm allowed to um, share, for example, we could have a look at the RBN Live if you wanted to. Yeah, for sure, Tony. This is all about, this is an interactive, as I've always said about this evening. This, and this is certainly, Jim will back me up here, this is not about all about Jim's uh, programme at all. It was just that we needed someone here, a resident expert for it. But this is all about sharing experience as well. And this is why Steve asked for it in the first place. You know, he wants to learn more. Um, well, if I just share, I mean, most of you will have seen the Reverse Beacon Network, but if I just share my screen briefly. Okay, we'll be able to just, um, we'll be able to then share that with everybody else on the BATC and Facebook as well. I don't think we've got it well, quite what yet. What have I done? Share. While you're working on that, Tony, I'd just like to also mention to everybody at home as, uh, as well, I'm sure most of you realise, but there is a propagation forecast, which obviously is fairly general, um, probably a couple of hundred words. But uh, Jim is part of the team that puts that together with G4BAO and uh, Steve G0KYA. And it's published every week on the NARC website, uh, normally on a Friday. You should find it on the website and also in the newsletter. And also a, a similar version to that also goes out on the RSGB. So if you want an easily digestible version without going online to look at a tool, um, that's also very good and gives you just a general feel about uh, both HF and VHF and up, uh, the sort of, it, of conditions generally that you're going to get in the coming weeks. So, I mean, that's another tool in your armory, really, isn't it, to make the most of it. Um, I don't know if we've got... Uh, no, we haven't got Tony's picture yet or shared screen, Tony, I'm afraid. Yeah, unfortunately, um, and the security a... on this is so so wonderful that you can't get anything to work. Okay, we have allowed it because um, we're sort of hosting the Zoom call, and as you can see, St uh, Jim has shared his screen, so there's nothing um, stopping you from doing that from our point of view, anyway. While you're doing that, uh, while you're looking at that, um, Tony, and I'll let you know, Tammy, will let me know as soon as we've got. Oh, well, now we've got it, I think, actually, Tony. So we'll yeah, come to your I, screen I'll... now. Yeah, I'll just get rid of this. is This is Reverse Beacon Network, which hang on, we'll get rid of them. Which is which is great fun because you can see QSOs happening in real time. Or, I mean, basically, I don't know whether you can see, but the red spots are people who can hear, and the blue spots are the are the DX. So, for example, that which I'm moving my thing over is a um, purple purple is a twenty meter across the Atlantic. So it's been, you know, uh, and you can see down the bottom, it's listing what they are individually. And I find this is, you know, if you just want a quick idea of what's going on in the world, you and you can select just one particular frequency. If we select just 20 meters, you can see all the 20 meter contacts or spots that have gone on. I mean, here you've got somebody in Australia being spotted by somebody in Mongolia or hmm. wherever yes. UAOS is, yes. UA0S is. And I just find that, you know, just if you want to have a quick look without having to understand a great deal about uh, propagation. As you say, it's live as well, isn't it, Tony? Oh, this is live, yes. Hmm. This is the Reverse Beacon Network live. And I find that's a great toy. And also, um, I'm going to unshare that um, because... I don't know what I'm doing much of the time. Am I back again? Yes, I am. You are, Tony. Uh, Can you just, um, before we leave that completely, could you just tell us what the URL on that was, what the main website address was? It reversebeaconnetwork.org? From memory, that is. Um, so if you on. could just read it out. Reversebeacon.net. Reversebeacon, reverse all okay. one word, dot net. Okay, so there we are for everybody at home now. Reversebeacon, all one word, dot net. Uh, if you uh, want and to that's a that. great toy. And of course, you've got Whisper, the weak signal propagation reporter, which means you can you can run the appropriate software. Which, um, if you've got FT, you know FT, you know the Whisper software, you can just run a sort of one watt signal and see how your antennas are working around the world, which is a great toy. Um, Mm. But anyway, I mean, that's that's my top. No, well. it's brilliant, Tony. This is, as I said, this is exactly what tonight's all about. Sharing experiences and helping others who are just getting started or maybe. And we're all going to learn things from tonight as well. I haven't looked at Reverse Beacon Network actually for a few years. And um, that's, that looks They've like it's had a problem in They had a problem in that 
they couldn't uh, get it to the map to work. Google changed the rules or something. But they have um, a beta site now which you can access from the main site, which is the map I've just shown you. And, that's, and that works fine. And presumably that will go live in the fullness of time. Mm. But, but RBN, like anything else, is sort of amateur and volunteers and all the rest of it. So it is what it is. Absolutely, yeah. But what a brilliant resource. Thank you very much, Danny, for that. Got a few other bits of uh, comments now on BATC. Uh, so if I might, G4DYC says, great job, Jim, by you and Dan, etc. Tongue in cheek a bit. Is there any point in switching on or maybe CQing when the graphs point to poor propagation? Question mark, exclamation mark. One for you, Jim. Well, sorry, when the graphs point to what? When the graphs point to poor propagation. So is there any point in switching on? maybe CQing, you know, when, when it does that. I mean, it, I suppose what he's saying is, is it infallible or, you know, is it sometimes wrong? Well, uh, I, the, thing, the thing is, when you look at the graph, the graph is neither right nor wrong. It is a measurement. So it's a, it's a, it's a measurement of what the ionosphere is doing. So um, uh, it's then down to you to interpret it in a way which, which says, do I... Um, uh, do I stop mowing the lawn and get in, in, in the shack? The, th the, thing, the thing about PropQuest, it's more about explaining why things appear and sound the way they do, rather than necessarily, in, in this case, with the graphs, using it as a forecast. But, but you can use it as a planning tool, which I'll, I'll explain in a moment or two. And when I next share the slide, I'll show you a, um, I'll show you a thing which um, uh, I, I'm grabbing fairly regularly now from from the ionosons um as they come in and uh, those will be um hopefully put on the put on the PropQuest website any anyway so so that was that and and great from you tony about the um reverse beacon network yeah it's it's just fantastic the thing the thing about that is it, it's great to see what is a bit like looking at the dx clusters and so on it's great to see what paths are, are actually happening and then to look at your ionosons to see how that fits in with what the ionosphere is being measured at. What you have to keep in mind, of course, is that those nice looking paths across the states are fine, um, but you don't know anything about the state of the ionosphere halfway across. So PropQuest will only help you with the bit that's over the top of us. And, um, and, and, and that's where its usefulness is. And then you have to do a lot of <laughs> You have to make a lot of assumptions and approximations to extend it across to other other places, except in 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 uh, sporadic e stuff, which we'll come on to when I show some other screen sharings. Okay, Jim, thank you. Got a couple of other bits of feedback. Firstly, from Rick G uh, M Seven, sorry GMT. The propagation tool on Clublog is very good if you're trying to work somewhere in particular. You can select the DXCC of interest and the tool will show you which bands and time of day present present sorry, the best chance of a contact. Uh, the web address of Clublog, in case you're not sure, is clublog.org forward slash propagation for that. He also says PSK Reporter is good all round, but with very open options, it shows which bands are most active right now. And that address is pskreporter.info. So I hope that's helped you as well. Uh, and Roger G3LDI says, if you use the VE7CC user program, you can leave it running 24-7 on a DX cluster and see the solar data from WCY, from which you can determine what the HF bands might be like. So some really good advice there. Um, some good tips and some good websites and things to look at. Uh, go, going to everybody at home now, is there anybody else who'd like to say, I don't want to pick on anybody, we've got Alan and Ralph and Tony and Andy, I mean, is there any of you who would like to say anything about your experiences with prop propagation? Yeah, Andy, I'll come to you next. If you could unmute as well, Andy, please, thank you. Am I live? You are. Yeah, evening all, yeah, as a uh, avid DXO in the club, I use various propagation tools uh, when I'm in the shack. Uh, obviously, use gyms and uh, a few others that have been mentioned: Club Log, uh, Vocap, um, and a few others. Um, when it comes to the um, six meters sporadic E season, I use uh, DX maps. 
uh, which is a very good tool to see where there's sporadic greed or tropo or, or any of those types of uh, propagation. Um, it's worth sort of looking now because we're getting into the season of tropo at the minute on six. There's been some good DX work on six at the minute. And uh, there's signs of early ease as well where they're being spotted as well. So um, DX maps is uh, one to look at. Um, other tools you can use is uh, chat clusters, um, KST chat for uh, 10 meters and uh, um, two meters, 70 sims and um, six meters as well. So uh, that's another option for, for uh, propagation tools. And I think probably your best thing is being on the band and knowing where to be sort of listening, um, what times of day, what sort of countries you plan to work that sort of time of day when you're on and just having a general listen. Yeah, you can't beat your normal way for propagation and and uh, and that. Um, when it comes down to pileups, obviously there's no point calling in the pileup if you can hear the pileup, but he's not working any Europeans. You know, that's down to propagation as well. You know, it's uh, both ways, you know. <laughs> He might not be uh, uh, listening um, for, for that. So, um, yeah, that, that's a few tools I use. Mm. Club, Club Log, um, very good one. Uh, you can search any DXCC, um, pick a time a year, set the uh, minimum solar flux index and maximum index, and that will give you a rough idea and pinpoint an idea, ideal time for Gs to be working, say, VK9. You can put VK9 in there, search a, a, a time, a month, and uh, everything, and it will near enough pinpoint you a, a slot, say, between, I don't know, for VK9, probably 7 in the morning and 11 in the morning for one-way propagation, and the evening time, probably in the evening, around about 7 o'clock onwards, you know, um, depending on the band and mode. So, yeah, different things. Anyway, I'll hand it back to you. Uh, lovely, Andy. Thank you ever so much. It's all about sharing those experiences and the tools. And uh, as, as we're seeing, there's not one best tool for everything. And ultimate, as, is, as I said before, in life, you know, there's lots of different things to use for uh, different you jobs. You need to use them all. Every yeah. tool there, you, you have to have that, that every tool in your toolbox and use it, you know, to be, well, sort of blow my own trumpet, one of the top DXs in the UK these days. Um, you know, I'm using every tool in the book to get to that top spot of working the DX on the band. So whether it's Club Lock, Jim's Pop Quest, DX Maps, um, watching the clusters, not just one cluster, but three or four clusters, one in Europe, one in North America, using the RBN, you know, listen seeing where my signal's getting to know when it's there. If I'm on FT8, I'm using PSK Reporter and not just monitoring my transmit frequency, but I'm also monitoring the other bands to see where people are working in G hmm. on the other bands. So, yeah, that, there's tools there and you've just got to be there at the right time, the right they as well so yeah. I mean can I ask you Andy as you said you know you are one of the top DXs in the country and there's nothing wrong with saying that um so do you do you never just switch on your radios and hear what's on there or do you always go to one, one or more of these tools before you before you take part in a contest or or just a general DX uh general DX you know I come in from work I probably say to the XYL I'm going in the shack for 10 minutes and I have a quick scan around the bands, check on the bands and see what I'm list what what's out there. And then I'm either looking at a cluster to see what's on there. If if there's anything that I need to work in red or blue, you know, if it's a red one, it's a new DXCC for the year that I'm sort of chasing. If it's blue, I'm I'm neither on that band, that mode. So it all depends. I'm looking at a cluster all the time, you know. If I was to sort of share my screen, uh, I don't know if I can set, show you my screen. Uh, where am I looking for that? Share screen. It's normally uh, in the middle of the bottom of the screen, something like it's, that. 
and then we'll put it on the screen for everybody else. Yep, it's just about to come on, I think, Andy. Yep, so we can show that to everybody at home as well. Yeah, so this is my live log, you know, my log book. Um, so I'm monitoring, if you look where my cursor's pointing, 6 metres, 10 metres, 12, 15, 17, 20, 40, 80, and 160. I'm monitoring them bands on the cluster live at, all the time, mm. you know. So if I see anything that I need, you know, so these red ones are countries I need. Obviously, I'm looking at the band. If there's, you know, I'm not going to go on to 10 meters and point to TG9 because the propagation this time and evening probably Cat and Hell's chance of working that DXCC. Yeah. You know, because I know in my mind there's probably no propagation there. But if that was probably TG9 on 20 meters and it was red. I know that that band would be open that particular time coming up now where we'd be able to work TG9. Um, so, yeah, but that's, you get experience of knowing which bands, which modes, where where to be anyway. And then obviously this is what I'm list spotted on the, uh, from the cluster on the band that my radio is sitting on. Um, but yeah. Mm. And nice. you can see on the world map, the gray line, you know. Oh, yes, yeah, that's the bottom. Just for anybody watching on a home on a small device, you may not see the detail, but we're looking sort of bottom right hand corner, really. Yeah, of, the world uh, map, yeah. where it's grey, that's where it's grey line. You know, you, you've got your peak on the grey line, good propagation tool as well, you know. Use that to your advantage, the grey line, because it's always an enhancement trying to work DX mm. on grey line, if you can do it. You've got an awful um, lot of information on the screen. So are we looking at um, lots of different programs there, really, Andy? Is this no, this is one program. It's Logger 32. Okay. It's uh, a log book. So this is my complete log containing nearly 60,000 QSOs in it, uh, 58,879 at the minute. What did you do uh, last QSO. week? <laughs> My yeah. goodness me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I... I think it's probably getting on for about 3,000 for this year. Um, yeah, so... It's amazing. So that is your got, Bible, really, that one program. You can get a lot of information, can't you? Yeah, so I've got DX uh, spot history, anything that I've clicked on um, within the cluster. So um, down here where my cursor at the minute is the cluster, live cluster, so I can see um, all the spots people were putting on in the comments live and you know obviously pop populates on the band maps that i'm monitoring as well so yeah fantastic very, well thank very you very informative absolutely and thank you for sharing that because i know you know you are uh, as many uh, quite competitive and it's not everybody maybe would share all this information but you know you're going to help some people along the way there andy so thank you ever so much for this yep no problem brilliant Okay, um, so anybody else? You're Ralph. Now, I thought you were reaching for a glass of Scottish's finest, but no, Scotland's finest, but no, I think you want to talk. So let's, oh, here we go. Oh, it's empty. Let's go to see Ralph anyway. If... Hi, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm immensely um, um, jealous of people like Andy and Jim who have uh, so much at their fingertips. Uh, recently, I've been doing quite a bit of experimentation and sticking to just one frequency, really, and that's been 17 meters. And for those of us who are perhaps beginning in the in the hobby, um, I, I, I the clinician in me comes out, and the two things for me that are vitally important is one. What do I hear and what do I see? And I find myself um, going on to a band and very carefully going through that band to listen to what I can hear. Something that I think Roger LDI um, told me many, many years ago at the club. Listen, listen, listen. And I've been quite amazed at the people that I've spoken to over the last few weeks. Yeah, the bands have been have been favourable, 
but just listening and then going through, even in pileups, I've been getting through to from Canada to Florida and being given five nine on 50 whiskeys, I mean 50 watts. <laughs> and um, uh, the number of, of amateurs in, in the States have said, I picked you out of the cluster. And I think that's because I've been... I've been listening and I've been watching. And while I think um, what we've seen from Jim and Andy, I, I think that's phenomenal science and technology. There's nothing to beat what you see and what you can hear. And people will pick you out if you're, if you're careful, if you listen if you respond in the right way, clearly and deliberately, um, uh, people at the other side of the world will pick you out. And that's been true for me, Southern Argentina, uh, Australia, on 50 watts from my very simple station and my 18-foot uh, vertical, you can get round the world. So... Um, I would encourage uh, new hams to stick at it and listen, watch and listen, watch and listen. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ralph. That's good advice. Um, very good advice. And in fact, it um, goes probably hand in hand as well with something that Henry m 0 E just added a note on Zoom and says agrees with Andy, but call anyway. Otherwise, everybody sits back and thinks the bands are dead. And thanks for all the effort and help. It's a good point, really. So give it a try, as well as all these wonderful science tools and everything that you can get. Um, still get on the bands, otherwise they will be dead because nobody would go on and, and say anything. Anyway, I think this is probably time a good time. And if anybody at home on Zoom would like to come in now, I'm going to go to Jim again because I think you've got some other things. Oh, I, Steve, I'm going to come back to you first and then we'll go to Jim uh, to show something there. So uh, Steve M's 7 cni yeah, Andy mentioned something about tropos. I don't understand what the difference is between tropos and sporadic E that Jim was explaining a little while ago. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, I don't, if Andy doesn't mind, I think I'll go to, because we're going to Jim anyway now, I think we'll go to Jim uh, to look at his tools. But first, could you explain the difference then between those two, Jim? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the tropo stands for tropospheric. Uh, propagation, Steve, and um, and good evening to Ralph, by the way, and everybody else who's chipped in this evening. Um, it, it's it's great to have a good gathering. It's just like being in the school. Um, the the thing about tropo troposphere, the troposphere is the bit of the atmosphere closest to the Earth, so it's where the weather is. So the weather uh, is my sort of sort of main interest, so to speak. And one of the features with weather is that when you get areas of high pressure, big anticyclones, like we've got now, um, you get what's called tropospheric propagation. And that's because in the atmosphere, you get a, a layering in a high pressure. You know, uh, just trying to think how to visualise it for you. You know, sometimes on a still evening, like this evening, we don't, we don't have lovely smelling cold fires coal fires these days but you'd see the smoke rising up the chimney and then turning at right angles and drifting across mm. and and that's because the atmosphere gets layered and forms a temperature inversion and this isn't the place to go into all the details of that but it forms a a a boundary to upward motion in the air and they belong in areas of high pressure and these inversions tend to layer the atmosphere in a way that also changes the refractive index of the air. Now, you know, we're used to the idea, say, on a road on a hot sunny day, you see this shimmering where you get the reflection of the sky bouncing off the road and it looks like it's a lake of water on the road just ahead of you. And that's because of the change, the intense change in the refractive index of the air because of the temperature contrast. Well, in the atmosphere, when you get high pressure systems, you get this same contrast, but but it doesn't um, 
it doesn't uh, come into play in light frequencies, but it does affect the refractive index for radio signals. So you get VHF radio signals ducted uh, between the surface and, and this inversion layer, or getting trapped within the inversion layer, so it sort of snakes along. And, and the scale of the path that you might work is the same sort of order as the scale of the area of high pressure. Well, high pressure systems are quite big systems. You saw on the TV weather maps the last couple of days or so, this high is extended right the way across from Poland, across to the UK and so on. So you get lots of tropo DX, as it's called, across the North Sea into Northern Europe and so on, and totally unconnected with what's going on in the ionosphere up here. So tropo is in the troposphere where the weather lives and it might be the interesting bit is probably no higher than about 4,000 feet or so above the ground. Um, the sporadic E layer, well let's say a kilometre and a half and the sporadic E layer is up at about 120 kilometres, 110 kilometres and there's nothing there's nothing about the weather up here um, that, that, that makes tropo. It's all the bit down near the ground where the high pressure is and the fogs are. Does that um, answer your question, Steve? Yes, I think it does. Um, I'm assuming this is very much related to what I was um, picking up December, January on, say, the two metre band. I was listening to MB and all of a sudden getting the repeater at Folkestone. Yeah, so that would have been exactly that. that. Tropo that was affecting that. Would I be fixed? That, that is exactly yeah. right. And the way to tell the difference very often is that if you're hearing sporadic E on a band that can have both sporadic E and tropo, sporadic E is usually very fleeting. The signal's there and then it's gone and type of thing, especially, especially on two metres. You know, to imagine sitting there in your shack, Steve, and hearing an Italian station on two metres from sporadic E, that's a very sort of magical moment, but it's, it's, it's gone five minutes later. Whereas tropo lasts a long while because high pressure systems last a long while. So you might get a half a day's worth, perhaps even two days worth of tropo, whereas sporadic E is much more fleeting. Okay, Jim, I think, and hopefully that's helped, Steve. Yes, it has. It's, um, it, so I was picking up that repeater from Folkestone quite a bit, and I, I wasn't quite sure which sort of propagation I was actually receiving, but that's now answered the question. Thank you ever so much for that, Jim. Yeah, good stuff. OK, well, if, if it's OK, David, mm. I'll share the screen again, shall I? And just yes, please. Yeah. Pop, pop these other things on. Um, so it, just let everybody at home know now we've read through all the questions that have been sent. If you do want to submit any more questions or comments or anything like that, sharing experience or anything, can you be doing that in the next few minutes, please? Uh, but now back to Jim. Right. Well, this is something I'm working on at the moment, and I'll just talk about this very, very briefly. And it's a way of plotting the, the, the y-axis up here is the height of the sporadic E patch, if you like. And here is time going along the x-axis. So it's the beginning of the day to the end of the day. And this is a report from uh, Dubs, which is in Belgium, on the 5th of June last year. So it was um, HFNFD last year. And the first thing you see is how variable the height of an ease layer is. This black line, the black curve, you can see it's all over the shop. But there are some, sometimes you can pick out trends, like a descending trend here. And, and there, are, there are believed to be two key descending trends in the day, which correlates with our two sporadic E windows of activity, a morning and a and, and a late afternoon evening thing and what happens is as the ease layer the sporadic e descends it's converged into a denser and denser layer until it's high enough to refract 10 meter signals which is the bluey color and if it if it gets really tightened up to the point where it's even denser it might open up six meters and you can see here this lime lime greeny color is a six meter period of activity. And the same thing happens at the end of the descending period in the evening. And then this is just a colourful way of showing the same thing. That, that one thing is really interesting. Um, as the FOEs, this critical frequency of the E's patch increases, you can imagine the colour coding says purples are 
early afternoon. So they start off quite high. These purple dots here, 135 kilometers. And then it slowly descends through the purple into this gray color. And the gray cut purple into gray is a late afternoon, early evening bit. And you can see how the FOEs increases as it descends. And the same was true earlier in the day in the morning. You've got this greeny color for the start of the of the period when the ease is beginning to form high up at 135 kilometers. And then it comes down and you get these orangey colors here and they sort of peak around mid to late morning. And that got up to eight megahertz for um, the FOEs. So, so when you start to reveal what ease looks like, if you plotted this, and I'm hoping that at some stage when I've finished the development work on these graphs, we'll get this up as a real time thing for our nearest um, ionosons and uh, you'll be able to see you know if there's a layer developing and how far along it we are so it's a it's an interesting but there's loads of these interesting things and what it does reveal is why some days are good for ease and others aren't because you don't get all of this stuff going on and you you don't get these nice intense layers forming anyway so that's all i wanted to show you about what's currently going on i just want to return to this and and something which i haven't mentioned uh, yet is this thing we've talked about archive for looking back at a previous date. What I want to show you here now is something called NVIS. So that's the near vertical incidence radio. So it's what you would use to do a local net. So if you were doing one of the 80 meter CW contests where you want to work within the UK, this is a very good tab to use because it shows the, um, um, the, the, the critical values of the um, of the um, FOF2. So you get the FOF2 in red. There's another one which we haven't dealt with yet called the FXL, which is the uh, extraordinary uh, refraction you get. And, and normally you'll be able to work signals even if this red line has gone below 3.5 megs, providing the blue line hasn't dipped below 3.5, you'll still be able to work something on 80. But it's a way of seeing how the band's changing. And you can see in the FOEs, it just follows a, a, a typical, not much happening at this time of the year sort of look. Although to pick up on Andy's point, um, in the CWT, CW contest today, I did have a sporadic key contact on 10 metres with a Spanish, no, in the Canaries, a station in the Canaries. So so it is possible to um, um, to get sporadic key outside of the main sporadic key seasons. Anyway, NVIS is a good one to use for inter-G type working, and that would be a handy one to keep above the band you're on if you want to work on the WAB net on 80. And you can see when it's usable on 40 and when it isn't as well. Right, compare we've done, but this is an interesting one, averages. So supposing you want to see what it's typically like during say um, June, you can, you, you can plan when to set your nets up. And this shows the average, so it shows the FOF2 as an average for the um, as, as an average uh, for that month of June at that particular time. So you can see there's a trend. You've got a dip uh, just before dawn. You've got a, a sort of a morning period when it's a bit higher, and then a peak in the early evening. But knowing how it behaves is a good way of then attaching that to what you hear on the band, as as um, Ralph was saying. And, and then the purple line is to do with ease. It's the highest ease frequency that's been um, reflected back. And you can see there are, there's a peak sort of here in this morning period. And then there's another peak here in the late afternoon, early evening. So you can see how the band behaves according to sporadic E sort of averages. Now, the interesting thing is if we look at say, um, February, and bearing a quick look at this one, and then February, um, you've got the much higher FOF2, but there's not so much clarity about the FOEs going on. So anyway, so right. Um, the next thing I want to say is about the ease blog. Now, what we do here, this is relating sporadic E chances to where the jet streams are. And on the map on a given day, you'll see these jet streams, which are the green. And if it's a really strong jet stream wind, it'll be in um, yellow and ambers. 
And those are turbulent areas in the weather bit, which can generate a turbulence, which can send wave and ripples all the way up to where the E region is. And it's believed that is something to do with why ease happens where it happens. It's not the time of day thing that's determined by something else, but it's the where it happens bit that makes these maps useful. And there are various lines on here which are explained in the about file. And during the season from May through to August inclusive, I put a note here saying which of the features I'm looking out for. And in the old days, I was looking at a, 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 a radial ring system, which just allowed you for a single hop on ease to see roughly, it's about two and a half thousand kilometers. So halfway is about 1200. And if you get one of these jet streams in that region, then it gets to be quite interesting. But of course, there's nobody, you know, going down to the southwest. There's nobody, um, nobody down here. And of course, this is sent in the middle of the UK. Anyway, then I developed something which was designed to, if I just show you this bit here, sporadic E, according to current thinking, is quite a complex thing made up of lots of different components. So it's got weather bits determining perhaps where it is. It's got stuff that happens in between the weather bits and the E region that controls whether these weather bits are effective or not. And then there's all this stuff going on up here, which is where the wind shear is, the magnetic field, solar input, the meteors, the fuel of it. All these things affect whether you get ease or not. So I designed it to put these together as best as I could into one single figure. And that figure gets plotted on a map. And you can see here, there is a map where you get hot spots of where either there's a jet stream or whatever. And the idea would be that you put your call sign in here for where you are, and you put the call sign of the DX station, and it would hopefully show a path across to the DX where the hot points are related to to where these these EPI index values are highest. So if I put in um, if I put in me in here, um, what is it? Uh, MP. If I do that, then that gives me that. Now we've got a problem with the map at the moment, which you just have to drag it to the right a bit, and then it comes back. Um, now, if I wanted to use somewhere else, I could. I could put in a call sign like K1, I don't know, XXZ, and um, uh, I'm guessing at locators here, I've got no idea. And we say which band we're on, let's say we're on 28 megs, and we do this, it plots a path where you can see where the reflecting points are. And uh, the one thing which you tell on this occasion is there isn't really a very good path um, down to North Carolina at the moment, um, because although we've got a hotspot for this one and this one, so this is where it hits the ionosphere and halfway along would be where it doesn't, where it's a, a sea surface reflection, but we haven't got the first hop for, for a sporadic E link across to the States. But, but you know, during the daytime, you could arguably say you've got an F2 layer thing because we saw from the graphs that those graphs did do on some days, even now, get up to um, 10, 10 metres. And you can see how it will change during the period by moving this slider along. You can bring it forward six hours and you'll notice the colours change as we go through different periods. And that's because you remember on that graph I showed you a while ago where you've got two times in the day when sporadic E happens. And these, these color codings for this index are adjusted for the local noon at those places on the map. So, so ultimately you'll be able to, it's not quite working yet. You'll have a little log here with your frequency, the distance of the path that isn't working at the minute. And then you can click this thing, which will store this whole map with your call sign and the other one and you can just save it as a PNG and just keep a log of the QSO and how it worked out with the sporadic E things. The whole idea is to refine these hotspot shadings to be better tuned to the bits of weather that are actually doing the job. And it's not entirely clear at the moment which bits are more effective than others. And I'm doing a lot of work coding away 
to try and refine this. So, so that's really where you're at. So uh, anyway, so, so that was the last few items of um, PropQuest I wanted to show you. But do bear in mind, you've got this about file up here, which gives you all of the text things to say what's what, what does what, and um, hopefully will explain once you get into it what's going on. But if in doubt, you know, I'm on 450 most days on two metres, so you can always pop up and ask a question. Expect to be deluged, uh, Jim, but maybe. But I mean, I think that it, what you just showed there actually with the introduction, that helps uh, probably put someone asked how much online help was there. But that's obviously going to help an awful lot. Jim, thank you ever so much for tonight. Um, and thank you, everybody, of course. I just, I'll just go quickly go back to those on Zoom. I think we've heard from most people except maybe Alan. Is, would any of you like to come on? Uh, no, no. OK, nobody else. So uh, thanks to everybody tonight for your questions on um, BATC or Facebook. Oh, actually, we've got one other comment from Steve who says, handy site to show tropo predictions is, uh, I'll read this out if you want to get a quick pen and paper. Uh, it's HTTP colon forward slash forward slash tropo dot F5 LEN dot ORG. And then there's forecasts for Europe and things like that. So that's one that's from Steve. Not sure of your call sign, Steve, but thank you for that. So thanks to everybody at home for all of these, um, all of the help tonight, all of the questions and also all the contributions, because that was really what it was all about. Uh, and I think you'll agree, a special thanks to Jim G3YLA for putting himself on the hotspot and answering so many of the questions, not just about PropQuest, but about propagation uh, in general. So thanks to all of you for that. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's NARC Live. We're almost at the end now. Just to tell you what's happening uh, this week on the club, uh, Sunday, the GB2S News at 7 o'clock on GB3MB as always. On Monday night, the Monday Night Net at half past seven with uh, Tim, M1 MIT. But remember, we'd love some other people just to volunteer so we can put a little uh, roster together for this month. Sorry, for next month. Uh, at half past eight, the 80 meter CW net on 3.543 megahertz. And next Wednesday here on NARC Live, it's the 30th of March and it's Anthony K8ZT talking about ham radio and life beyond repeaters. So thanks once again. That's almost it, Tammy, I think, from both of I'm us. I'm still here. You are still here, <laughs> I know. Thank you very much indeed, once again, to everybody who took part in tonight's programme, Interactive. Uh, we're really looking forward to that 6th of April, remember, for that first meeting. But we look forward to seeing you next week on NARC Live, as always, at half past seven. Until then, from Tammy, M0TC. Goodbye. And from me, David G7URP, take care of yourselves. And a quick look at everybody at home as well, waving. There we are. Good night. Bye-bye.